I want to talk about the ancient Eastern background a little bit. This is the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Finally. Yes. And I even provide you an addendum that you can sort of look at. Um, there are three main strands uh, of ancient Near East, uh, of debates related to covenant theology, in particular the ancient Near Eastern background. Three main strands. First, there is the connection between covenantal laws in the Old Testament, particularly the Mosaic covenant. So, uh, for example, Exodus uh, 20 and following. Um, connections between those laws and law codes in the ancient Near East. Um, both mentioned, for instance, an, an ox that gores. Um, and so how that relationship or how that connection is understood has been debated much in, in scholarship. Just to give you the broad strokes, there's been one thesis that's been argued that the Mosaic Covenant in 20 through 24, roughly, are, is, is pretty much just borrowing from completely the lo law code of Hammurabi. So a guy is sitting in exile in the Neo-Assyrian period, roughly 8th century, and is copying from the stela and sort of changing it up a little bit. A Jewish scribe is reading this cuneiform in exile and then is transforming it and, and changing it. And so there's this idea or theory about wholesale borrowing. The problem with that theory is, is that, well, on a number of levels, but on just a strictly evidence uh, data level, the problem with the theory is, is that the comparisons get quite broad in some instances. That are, they're not very rigorous in terms of the comparison model. Uh, the methodology is not stated well. Um, and, and finally, you can make connections between others, other laws that are actually fit better throughout the whole history of the ancient Near East. So there doesn't seem to be able, uh, the evidence doesn't seem to be able to carry the weight of, of the conclusion that the author is making, uh, despite the very nice and expensive OUP volume that you have to buy to read about it. <laughs> um, well, that's not what I want to focus on. Uh, the other, another key area of, um, of discussion is uh, about um, the date of Deuteronomy. When was Deuteronomy written? And so those who hold to classic Reformed theology or uh, typical evangelicals will say that Moses wrote Deuteronomy, so they would see that as taking place in Moses' lifetime. And um, other people would argue, no, it was written much later, and they would see it written at a different period probably in the exile, whether the first exile of the northern kingdom or the second exile in the southern kingdom. And typically, whatever someone's convictions about that, first point relates to how they view the, the composition of Deuteronomy in relation to other treaties uh, outside of the Bible. So typically those who want to uphold Mosaic authorship want to make connections to the Hittite treaties. And I'll get, if you look at Addendum 1, the comparison, you can just kind of rifle through these. You'll notice that Deuteronomy 5, 6 fits much like um, the Hittite uh, treaty and the covenant giver. Uh, there's a historical prologue, which is not appearing in the New Assyrian treaty. Um, and because of the absence of a historical prologue, uh, many people who hold to Mosaic authorship will argue that um, the, the, the historical prologue is one of the distinguishing features of a Hittite treaty. And that's important because the Hittite treaties were written close to the lifetime of Moses. Okay? But other scholars are trying to make um, connections to a later period, particularly with the exile of the northern kingdom with the Esarhaddon succession treaty. And they do this in a number of ways. The curses, particularly, are very similar um, between the Esarhaddon succession treaty and Deuteronomy 28. Um, there's also connections made with Deuteronomy 13, um, that's particularly with the Hebrew. Uh, the end of Deuteronomy 12 in your English Bibles is um, part of 13 in Hebrew. Um, the first verse of 13 in Hebrew. It's all there, it's just a different chapter division. It's not the Hebrew. Um, but they, you know, there's this elaborate sort of idea of, of inversion and copying. Uh, and there's also, though, um, Aramaic futility curses that appear uh, very similar to uh, what we find in Deuteronomy and elsewhere in Amos. So, example, you might, for example, a futility curse is you get to plant a vineyard, but you don't get to eat from it. You have a wife, but you don't get to enjoy her. You, uh, you know, sort of all of those ideas. You build a house, but you don't get to have to live in the house. It's a futility curse. And actually, what what you find is is that these are very common curses throughout the ancient Near East. Um, I think what it is, though, is 
Uh, I do think that the, the debate about the Hittite and Neo-Assyrian succession treaties and the relationship to Deuteronomy serve as a caution uh, for putting all of our apologetic eggs in a single basket. The debate is actually quite complex. And I think that we can probably arrive at the same good conclusions in a different way. Um, so I just want you to be aware that that's actually one of the main driving discussions when Deuteronomy is written. That's one of the main driving discussions for the use of ancient Christian backgrounds and covenants. Because Deuteronomy is structured as a covenant. Well, the most important, though, for our purposes is uh, the suzerain vassal treaty and land grant distinction. In 1970, Moshe Weinfeld came up with a theory that suzerain vassal treaties and land grants function very differently in the ancient Near East. The suzerain vassal treaty uses threats to induce loyalty. So you have a superior king and you have an inferior king or an inferior people. And those people who are under the rule of that king, they are given threats to induce loyalty, to encourage loyalty. That is, um, in other words, the conditions are placed upon the weaker party with attendant blessings and curses for fidelity or lack of fidelity. So, for example, you see at the end of Deuteronomy 27, 28, the blessings and curses. Um, so, according to this position, it's like a suzerain vassal treaty, and those are to induce future loyalty. But Weinfeld argued that land grants function very differently. He argued that land grants were reward for past loyalty. Rewards for past loyalty. So they Susan Vassal conditions to result in loyalty. Land grant loyalty that results in a gift. Previous loyalty that results in a gift. The grant, grant of land or even a position for past faithfulness. The grant is permanent and the threats are not against the recipient of the grant, but the one who might encroach upon the terms of the grant. What does that mean? Well, essentially, um, you, in the Susan Vassal Treaty, according to this theory, the, the conditions are placed upon the people in order to induce loyalty. In the covenant of grant, the, the threats are not against the people within the covenant who are receiving the grant. The threats are actually against anyone who might encroach upon that. And so the distinction then is used to understand the covenants of the Bible. Uh, this is a quote from Weinfeld. I think I have it in your, in your notes. Uh, Abraham is promised the land because he obeyed God and followed his mandate. So Abraham obeys God, and then God says, because of your past loyalty to me, I'm going to give you this land in perpetuity. And similarly, David, according to Weinfeld, was given the grace of dynasty because he served God with truth, righteousness, and loyalty. Well, these two categories then was received into biblical studies and were taken at face value as if they were able to interpret uh, ancient Eastern covenants perfectly and therefore inform our interpretation of the Bible. And it was received, of course, in Reformed theology as well. So if you're going to read anything at all written, probably whether a commentary or any books on covenant theology, um, you're probably going to come across this land grant and Susan Vassal type terminology. So understanding what we're talking about, even though it might seem convoluted or unimportant, it's actually really affected a lot of the way that the church receives theology. So we're kind of taking a step back and going underneath the layer and trying to understand what is, the, what is this all about and how do we understand it. Well, uh, two particular um, uh, people who, are, who, have, who have used this, this sort of understanding is um, Meredith Klein and Michael Horton, among others. And I think it's important to understand, first of all, that uh, Meredith Klein and Michael Horton, this is an in-house debate. You know, this is a debate between brothers, and uh, it's an in-house debate, and they're great theologians. Uh, Meredith Klein was writing his covenant theology, defending justification by faith alone against Norman Shepherd. He was defending the covenant of works against John Murray. He was uh, defending covenant theology against Fuller. That is the context in which he was writing. And so any quibbles or, you know, sort of pushback that I'm giving here is from a position of deep respect for what he did. 
and the context in which he was writing. But basically, um, I think it's also important to recognize, first of all, that Meredith Klein and Michael Horton and many others like them developed their position biblically, theologically, and exegetically first, and saw a co connections that made sense of what they were observing biblically, theologically, and exegetically. In other words, if we sort of come away from this looking at it going, I don't think those categories quite work, that's not the end of the debate. The debate must continue, but at the level of exegesis and theology and, 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 and biblical theology. So with those caveats in mind, I want to sort of um, give a basic summary of how this was used. Basically, the Suzer Vassal Treaty was considered to be the Mosaic Covenant. And the Abrahamic Covenant, by contrast, was the Covenant of Grant. So the Suzer Vassal Treaty is um, using conditions, threats, blessings, and curses to induce future loyalty. Whereas the Abrahamic Covenant or the Davidic Covenant were being given, to God, given by God to them for a past faithfulness that they had. Now that past faithfulness is not perfect. The past faithfulness is genuine and sincere faithfulness. So they recognize that Abraham and David were sinful, right? But that the, their obedience that they did sort of partake in or serve or give to God took on a typological significance. You know what a type is. Type is Aaron, the chief priest. He is a type of Christ. Or Melchizedek is a type of Christ. It doesn't mean that they are a one-to-one -one correspondence, but they point forward. They would see a similar typology with works. It's not so much that it was perfect works, but the works that they performed, the faithfulness that they performed, flawed as it was, was genuine, sincere, and it pointed forward to the ever so important act of obedience of Christ. So it was a typological argument. I summarized it as this. The Mosaic Covenant, according to this position, was an administration of the covenant of grace. So they saw at the level of salvation still grace by faith, you know, salvation by faith, right? And um, so the individual, individual salvation, like the Abrahamic covenant, was by faith. However, a typological national covenant was overlaid administratively. So at the fundamental level, you have justification by faith. And on top of that was a national covenant that was overlaid, that typologically uh, pointed forward to the obedience of Christ. The obedience required to maintain life in the land although not strictly meritorious, was typological, pointing forward to the active obedience of Christ, through whose imputed merit we obtain life in heaven. Key passages for this position will be Leviticus 18.5, do this and live, uh, Galatians 3.12, and Romans, Romans 10.5. So I want to set aside the exegetical debate and most, mostly return now to the typology because... Uh, or the, the, the ancient or eastern typology. So the idea of this suzerain vassal category and land grant category, and these two being fundamentally different. I want to return to that briefly because I think that we need to get that out of the way so that we can think about what's actually going on biblically, theologically, and exegetically. Gary Knoppers wrote a criticism of, um, of Moshe Weinfeld's uh, position, which really was just widely accepted for many years. And he argues, and Knoppers demonstrates, that the structure, form, and content of royal grants are much more complicated than Weinfeld's typology allows. There is, moreover, significant evidence that land grants were predominantly conditional in nature and function. In other words, there weren't kings going around giving you land or positions for past faithfulness and having no expectations for the future. They were fundamentally conditional. We can see this because land grants were given and then they were taken away. Even if it said to eternity, well, to eternity also could mean until it stopped uh, for them. Um, we also know that land grants often were established when they were taking something from someone and giving it to someone else. There were ongoing implicit conditions, but even sometimes in the covenant of grant that, that we see, I could have brought in several, their conditions are explicitly stated, like service that you have to perform for the future. So there is conditions within this grant that Weinfeld said was unconditional. So I think the ancient or eastern evidence on the basis, of, the argument on the basis of the ancient or eastern evidence cannot be sustained. 
The neat typology offered by Weinfeld does not, uphold, does not stand up to the evidence. So the debate about the nature of the Mosaic Covenant must continue, exegetically and theologically, but without an insufficient or inaccurate ancient Near Eastern typology or grid to run it through. So what then can we say about the informative background of the Old Testament, of the ancient Near East in relation to the Old Testament? I think the first thing we want to say is, is that the background needs to stay in the background. The background cannot come to the foreground of our study of the Bible. That's actually true of looking at other texts. You also don't want to study external texts from the ancient Near East and run them through the grid of the Bible. The Ezra Haddon Succession Treaty only recently, even though we've known copies for a very long time, only recently was it studied on its own terms, independent of the Bible. It goes both ways. We don't need to impose the study of a text, uh, you know, an external text, upon an, a, another text in this way. On the basis of the actual textual evidence and on the basis of the broader theological, uh, theoretical considerations, Weinfeld's typology simply cannot stand against the evidence. The debate about the relationship between the Mosaic Covenant and the other covenants, such as the Abrahamic and Davidic, must be continued exegetically and theologically, but without an inaccurate typology formulated on ancient Christian forms that cannot be sustained by the evidence. The covenants of the Bible share numerous points of comparison with related texts and practices found more broadly in the ancient Near East. And while comparative projects will, con will continue to yield interesting results and insights related to the biblical covenants, a portion of their success will be directly related to the extent to which they are able to pay attention to, the, to both the points of continuity and discontinuity between the various texts and textual traditions. In other words, you don't just want to study comparisons or similarities, you also want to look at differences. The strengths of these insights also can only be judged over time. As many assumptions and theories about the seriological evidence have been tested and significantly changed as new texts are published and theories are considered afresh against the evidence. For example, the existence of tidy categories such as land grants and suzerainty treaties has proven to be unable to stand up against the evidence, despite the prominence of such theories in biblical studies. In short, it is unlikely that the ancient Near Eastern evidence can solve our theological debates. But neither should it. Although incapable of solving the key exegetical and theological problems often asked of it, this is not an attempt to be dismissive of the ancient Near Eastern evidence for solidifying and informing biblical exegesis. I've devoted my life to say this stuff, so obviously I think it's important. The rituals of oath-taking, I just want to give you one example. The rituals of oath-taking with blessings and curses are known from other ancient Eastern covenants and treaties. And the suzerain to the vassal relationship is reflected in the Israelites taking these oaths upon themselves. God is the suzerain, he's the superior king, and they are the vassal, they are the servant. Yet with the Abrahamic covenant, something surprising occurs. Turn to Luke, Genesis 15. Covenants are either parity or, or they're, they're between equal parties or unequal parties. At the most basic level, you've got people who are, who are brothers, or you've got people who are slave to a master, or a father to a son, or a king to a slave, and, and so on. But with the Abrahamic covenant, something very surprising happens. If, if you have a, a, a covenant between equal parties, then you expect the conditions to fall upon both parties. And that's how it actually happened. They would send texts to each other, they would negotiate the terms, and then they would take oaths, and they might touch their throat, or they sacrifice a donkey in the ancient Near East. And what we think that sort of indicates is that, may I, may I die if I break these covenants? May I become like the donkey if I, I break these covenants. But whenever only one party takes on the obligations of themselves, it's always the inferior party. Uh, in the rest of the text that we've seen so far, it's always the inferior party. But Genesis 15, after Abraham has sacrificed the, an the animals, a vision of the Lord occurs, and only the suzerain, God himself, passes through the covenantal obligations, and he brings them upon himself. What seems to be the idea behind the rituals found in the ancient Near East is confirmed in Jeremiah 34, verses 17 through 22. And I'll just read the pertinent 
passage, verse 18. And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and pass between its parts. That seems to point to exactly what Abraham is looking at in the visual. You remember, the animals are separated, they're sacrificed, and only God passes through. Now what does that mean? God is saying, may I become like these animals if this covenant is not fulfilled. And that's unexpected because you would expect God is the superior party in the covenant that he would not be taking the obligations upon himself. In Genesis 15, though, only the Lord is taking the obligations upon himself. May he be cursed. May he die if this covenant is violated. And as the New Testament teaches, the unthinkable happens at Calvary. When God was cursed and God died for his people. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should stop? In our next lecture, we're going to discuss how Abraham is the father of faith. We're going to talk about the grammar of the gospel of Abraham and what Abraham believed about God. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you that Christianity is, a, is about personal prayer now, that you are our God, you are our hope, you are our Redeemer, and we are your people. And Lord, we thank you for satisfying the conditions that we could not meet. And Lord, as we continue to walk through and study covenant theology, Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to sit and marvel, uh, to grow in understanding, yes, but to also marvel and be moved to worship uh, at the goodness and the glory of what you are doing. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. That was great. So, uh... Tonight, we'll start at 5 o'clock. Uh, we'll have the potluck afterwards. So, um, you may have questions. Um, you may have raised stuff that you just aren't sure of. Um, let me encourage you to come back tonight. What we'll do is tonight, we'll have a little bit more time um, to be able to have some questions, more than we would be able to have on, on even Sunday morning. Um, and so, um, have questions, jot them down, even after the lecture tonight. And then um, things you're just totally stumped that you don't think anyone can answer, just throw it on them. <laughs> uh, but I uh, encourage you to keep looking at that. There's a confidence that we can have in the Bible that God has given us. Um, that in it, he has unfolded the, the riches of his covenant mercy and love for us. And so we encourage us to, to take up and read. So... Um, they're dismissed. You hang around. There's still food in the back. Um, we'll see you back at five o'clock, and we'll have uh, have dinner together after that. So, thanks.